This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Kevin! Hey, hey! The diamond shop scenes in Uncut Gems are some of the most frantic and chaotic scenes I think I've ever seen in a film. In the midst of this chaos, there is an interesting creative choice that you probably didn't notice. The Safties create a visual distinction between the front of the diamond shop and the back room by using two different types of camera movement. When shooting out front, they have the camera on a steady cam, and when shooting in back, they use handheld camera movement. They use both in a similar way to generate a chaotic energy, but this very intentional choice gives the two spaces a distinct feel that you almost certainly picked up on despite not noticing the choice directly. The division illustrates how one space is a place where Howard has to perform and be smooth, and another is a space where he can be more vulnerable and unstable. With Uncut Gems, the Safdie brothers are pulling off a kind of sleight of hand. The film feels like it's out of control and like it might fly off the rails at any moment. But within that, they're making careful, delicate choices that construct a very specific experience. Let's get underneath all the chaos and look at the editing, cinematography, and sound to examine how the Safdie brothers are so carefully constructing such an unhinged film. Sound is the unsung hero of film. I'm almost there. I'm and I think it's one of the most important components of the tense atmosphere that Uncut Gems creates. The Safties ratchet up the tension of the film by filling the soundscape with sounds that are typically anxiety producing in our own lives. Wow. Get a hammer. You're hitting me? And hit it from the side. Oh, Dang, it's not gonna. Let me you loan the Come here. I know that. Come on, come on. All these things vie for our attention audibly throughout the film, and it never allows us to truly relax. Probably one of the most talked about and noticeable uses of sound design in the film are the layers of dialogue that the Safties use. In many scenes, in addition to the primary dialogue that drives the story, there are many overlapping pieces of smaller dialogue that add texture, chaos, and atmosphere to these scenes. Let me clean this for you. Can you. Clean them really Let me quick. throw them in the ultrasonic for you, for free, this gonna okay? Cost, for free. For free, for real? Push them nothing, man. Sure. I would think you'd nah, have bigger good. rocks than that. Just because you're a big guy. That's what we're here for. Okay. Let's see what y'all got in here. Who would win in a fight, Ben Wallace or Tony Allen? Okay. all day. The Safties are very careful with their mix. While there are many layers, and often background characters' lines will overlap with the primary dialogue, it's designed and mixed carefully enough that you don't ever miss any important information. In the most chaotic scenes, characters often repeat themselves, so if you miss a line the first time, you'll probably catch it the second time. The Safties captured a lot of overlapping dialogue in the performances, but working together with sound designer Skip Leavesay, they also layered in a lot of additional dialogue to make things even more chaotic. While additional dialogue recording or ADR is usually used to re-record lines that weren't clear enough in the original recording or to change small details in the plot, the Safties wrote an additional 45 page script of extra lines to record to use as background filler for scenes. This technique is impressive and very effective, but but there's more to what's going on in the sound design. The film's score is a unique, evocative, and powerful force in the film, but what's most impressive is the way the score intertwines with the film's soundscape. Watch this moment and listen to how the timing of the car horns fit perfectly with the rhythm of the score and the dialogue together. Eddie boy, what are you doing? What do you want, Eddie? Look what I got. Look, you're gonna love this. Here, hey, I'll, what's that I right the there? Phone, you ask Will you leave me alone? What is it? Here's another example. Listen to this moment, which you might need headphones to hear. As Howard unpacks the gem and begins to look at it, the score comes in and the sound design becomes more subjective and ethereal, representing the feelings evoked in Howard by the gem. And for just a brief second, the bubbling of the fish tank in the background comes into the mix. Howard, hello? I'm standing here, man. There's a lot of people I could be doing business with other than you, Howard. You're, you're it has this weird underwater texture for a moment and helps transition us into this bizarre soundscape almost created by the gem. It's a little genius touch of sound design that you'd almost certainly never notice unless you were listening specifically for the Foley. When I've criticized films with bad editing in the past, something that has repeatedly come up 
is a pace that is too fast. But while fast cutting can cause a lot of issues, it isn't inherently a problem on its own. Uncut Gems has a lot of great examples of how to do fast editing well. Let's break down the auction scene. 20,000 now, 30,000. Do I have 40,000 now? 40,000, gentlemen's bid. Pleasure to see you, sir. The scene is just over three minutes long. In the 187 seconds of this scene, there are 90 cuts. That's an average of about two seconds per shot. So what makes the fast editing in a scene like this a disaster, while in this one, it works great and even benefits the scene? The first reason we'll look at is rhythm. While there's no music, the auctioneer's voice and delivery has a distinct cadence. Watch this small section and pay attention to how the timing of the cuts and the natural rhythm of the auctioneer's delivery work together. 50,000 now in a new place. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to have you back too, sir. 50,000 now against you, sir. Should we say 60? 60,000 now against you, sir. 70,000 now against you, sir. 100 grand. 100,000 now. For this section, there's an established pace to the cuts. 50,000 now in a new place. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to have you back too, sir. 50,000 now against you, sir. As soon as Kevin Garnett cuts in with his unexpectedly high bid, it disrupts the established rhythm of the edit for a few beats. 100 grand. 100,000 now. Bid then you, a new character, the sort of villain of the film, enters the scene and a longer shot places special attention on their entrance. I'll bid with you, sir, in a great place, a big, bold, giant leap for a big, bold, giant leaper. Did you also notice how the timing of the lines big, bold, giant leap and big, bold, giant leaper are matched with the entrance of the two characters? Rhythm isn't the only thing that makes these quick cuts work, though. Each cut also has a clear motivation or intention. One of the easiest ways to motivate a shot is with an eye line. As humans, we have an extremely developed sense of where people are looking, and naturally we pay close attention to where the characters are looking on screen. Editors can use eye lines and the movement of eyes to help direct our attention around a scene and to help things feel cohesive. Let's look at this sequence of shots that use an unbroken series of eye lines. First, we start with Howard's father-in-law, then he glances at Howard and we cut to Howard, who is glancing back. Then he glances towards the auctioneer and that's where we cut. The auctioneer is looking at the father-in-law, so we cut there. Then we cut to Arno. The father-in-law's eyeline wasn't directed at Arno, but Arno is looking at the father-in-law, so there's still a meaningful connection between the two shots. It's subtle, but Arno's eyeline then shifts from the father-in-law to Howard, and then we see this over the shoulder POV of Arno looking at Howard. Not every shot is or needs to be connected via an eyeline like this, but using eyelines in this way links one shot to the next, which keeps us from being confused about why a cut was made. It's immediately obvious. We're now seeing what a character was looking at. Having a super obvious motivation is what helps keep us from becoming confused or disoriented even as the camera quickly shifts around the room and between many characters. The eyelines in this scene are also incredibly important because they carry much of the scene's conflict and drama. Going Going into this scene, a complicated set of stakes and contexts have been established. The Safties can play off the underlying drama to create conflict simply by having the characters exchanging looks. Howard's look of relief when another bidder enters the fray, his father-in-law's look of doubt, KG's look of desire for the diamond, Arno's confusion about what's happening, and then his disbelief as he puts the pieces together. All of this emotional conflict and action is created by the Kuleshov effect. We see a character looking at something, and then it cuts to what they're looking at, and we infer a dramatic relationship between the two. There are many great examples of good editing throughout the film, but the speed of cutting in this scene in particular is important because the fast pace helps maintain the tension and anxiety of the rest of the film during a scene where the characters are just sitting and listening to what's happening. The types of camera movement and the focal lengths chosen by the Safdie brothers alongside cinematographer Darius Kanji played a big role in helping give many of the scenes chaotic momentum. In the scenes in the jewelry shop, some of the most chaotic and stressful in the film, the brothers primarily used a steady cam to give themselves freedom to move the camera around as much as they wanted, adding to the energy of the scene. But they did something that really pushed this approach in a unique direction. By using more telephoto lenses on a Steadicam than what's normal, they were able to create an effect where the movement through the space feels exaggerated. When Howard walks across the room and the camera follows him or pans with him, the background moves 
passed faster than it would seem to with a wider lens. Using this technique allows the camera to move freely on many axes at once. It can swoop forward and backward or move horizontally in one direction, even as the lens is panning with a character walking in another direction. For a shot like this one, there are many ways you could have set up a shot of Howard running down a hallway. You could stick the camera on a dolly and smoothly track backwards as he runs. You could have the camera on a steady cam with a wider lens and smoothly and quickly drift straight backwards. You could have handheld camera and frantically shakily follow him down the hall. But instead, the Safties employ what looks like this steady cam telephoto lens combination which eliminates the shake and jitter of a handheld shot, but which still swings from side to side, almost careening down the hall the same way Howard himself does. Less stable than a dolly move and more stable than a handheld camera move, this combination of chaotic movement while still being controlled, I think embodies the ethos of the Safdie's approach. I have every intention of paying you back. I'm broke right now. The use of more telephoto lenses means the camera is also further away from the characters than it would have been if the wider lens was used. This means it's easier to have characters walk between the subject and the camera, creating layers of motion between us and what we're trying to focus on and pay attention to. This is an effect that the Safties employ freely, much in the same way they use layers of non-essential background dialogue to partially obscure bits of primary dialogue. In many scenes, the camera dives forward, backward, sideways, and people obscure the frame, and there are few or no establishing shots to ground the geography of the space we're in. But like I talked about in the editing section, things like eyeline, rhythm, and composition motivation are still very intentional and ground us in the midst of all this. It's easy when looking at a scene like this one for the collection of compositions to feel chaotic and random, but there are still clear patterns and divisions that are being used to signify meaning. I already mentioned the shift between handheld camera in the back room and steady cam in the front, but watch how the composition gets tighter and less chaotic in this moment as Howard and Damani get into an argument that neither of them want KG to hear. There's high energy to this whole scene, but shifts in composition like this still help separate a long chaotic scene into recognizable pieces. The specific use of zooms in key moments, as opposed to just pushing in closer with a steady cam, is also another great example of this. All these decisions are the kinds of visual choices that help communicate certain emotions or emphasize moments that any good director will utilize. But for the Safties, these very intentional moments, while they still achieve their desired effect, are less immediately noticeable unless you're looking for them, in the midst of all the movement that exists just to create visual energy and chaos in the scene. It's the careful balance between these two things that keeps the film from spinning out of control. Yeah, yeah. Did I not tell you that was gonna happen? Yeah, I'm sorry. So I'm now sorry. what? In each of these areas I've talked about, the Safties have a bit of a get out of jail free card. Because they're creating a film that is supposed to generate anxiety and discomfort in the viewer, they can freely employ techniques more chaotically that other filmmakers would probably avoid because they don't want to make their audiences uncomfortable. But there's a big difference between creating a sense of discomfort or chaos that feels like it's part of the story and experience and just confusing the viewer with a barrage of images and sounds that they have a hard time understanding within the context of the story. The difference between these two lies in how carefully all these things, even when they are uncomfortable and chaotic, are arranged. It takes a mastery of cinematography, editing, and sound to be able to craft an experience that makes you feel like you might slip loose and lose the thread at any moment, while in reality, you're being led by the hand further into the grip of its suspense. I know many of you are watching my channel because you're interested in filmmaking, making video essays, or doing some kind of creative work. And no matter where you are in that process or what you're interested in creating, continuing to learn is extremely important. Skillshare, my sponsor for this video, is a great way to do that. I've used Skillshare to learn about filmmaking, graphic design, and productivity. Say you want to learn more about cinematography. You could check out Ryan Booth's class, DIY Cinematography, Make Your Video Look Like a Movie. What I love about this class is that Ryan focuses on techniques that utilize the existing environment, like how to use a window as a light source. 
So you can learn how to improve your cinematography without really needing a ton of fancy equipment or the ability to build a set. Skillshare is an online community with thousands of classes that will teach you new skills and inspire you to get out there and create. Whether you're just starting out or looking to deepen your abilities from cooking to video editing, Skillshare has options for everyone. And the first 1,000 people to click the link in my description will get a one month free trial to Skillshare Premium so you can start exploring your creativity today. Skillshare is built for learning. It's easy to stay focused because there are no ads to distract you and they're constantly adding new high quality premium classes. So click the link in the description to get your one month free trial and start learning now. I'm a big fan of Skillshare. Thanks again to them for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much to my patrons. I recently crossed 100 patrons, and to celebrate that, I'm making a video for my patrons about my top 25 favorite films. So if you want to see that or listen to the podcast where I talk about what I've been watching every month, go to patreon.com slash thomasflight to sign up.